Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in this evening. I am Bruce McFarland. I'm an orthodontist in Winnipeg, Canada, and this is Full Speed Ahead Orthodontics with uh, Microosteoperforation. Um, the assumption is that if you're listening in today, you've already heard about microosteoperforation, perhaps tried a few cases, and are interested in maybe learning a little bit more of the applicability or perhaps uh, some of the protocols that we use in our offices. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited to spend the next hour with, with you, and thank you in advance for, uh, for spending it with me. Uh, we're having lots of fun with, uh, with Propel these days. Um, again, uh, through, with the disclosures, I am not uh, an employee of any dental company, nor do I own stock, nor do any of my family members. Uh, but I do work with Propel Orthodontics, Align Technology, and Henry Schein Orthodontics as well. And um, for that, I am paid. I uh, bring you greetings from Winnipeg, Canada. We're right up here right now. I'm pretty excited to announce that I have a, a second office uh, in Thunder Bay, Ontario um, now, which is on the western shore of Lake Superior. And uh, so shout out to my colleagues in Thunder Bay. So tonight we're going to explore a little bit more um, about the uh, microosteoperforation system. And I, I got to tell you, I'm learning along, right along with all of you. And uh, it's, it's just been quite compelling to me how many applications there are for the, uh, for the microosteoperforation system and how many different orthodontic maneuvers um, can actually be helped and sped up and made more efficient through uh, incorporating microosteoperforation into your practice. So it's an exciting time and uh, really, really getting a kick out of it and enjoying it. Uh, many of you uh, have seen sort of the first generation of the device, which was a single use uh, with uh, Propel hand device um, that was to be used once and then discarded. Uh, lately, most of us have been using the, uh, the, dis the disposable tip device with a reusable handle, so only the, the tip uh, has to be um, thrown away as a, as a sharp, of course, and um, a little more environmentally friendly, I think, for sure. Excuse me. <coughs> and then uh, the latest and greatest, and we're pretty excited about it, I'm going to show you a little bit more about this today is a contra-angle um, handpiece that um, Propel has come along with. And uh, it's, it is made specifically for microosteoperforation. And uh, it is well controlled and well governed to, uh, to provide the correct uh, RPM and provide the correct amount of pressure for uh, for using uh, it for microosteoperforation. So, you know, right away people say, gee, you know, that looks off awfully like a slow speed handpiece. Um, but one must be aware that uh, one of the uh, enemies of successful microosteoperforation is going to be heat and speed. And um, this device uh, is designed to have neither uh, too much. It um, It's, uh, this this uh, reusable uh, pr contra angle is, will have the reusable burrs in it, uh, looking very much like a uh, uh, slow speed handpiece. But uh, we honestly do not recommend that a regular slow speed handpiece be used for this purpose. Uh, there is no, not enough control over how fast it goes and, and um, how deep it goes. And, both of which uh, we have good control with this device. So I'm going to show you uh, a little bit on that. So we've got this down to a pretty good routine in our office now. Um, in Manitoba, in, where I practice as, as an orthodontist, we have orthomodule dental assistants. And uh, they're able to do a lot of the preparatory work uh, for me. and. Um, so they will actually, we, we will have decided um, the appointment beforehand 
what is to be done for this particular patient, and it will be uh, in the chart. Uh, the appointment beforehand, we will also have explained the procedure to the patient and, um, and have them signed an informed consent, which is actually available from Propel, and uh, it's, it is, it's good and comprehensive. So the next appointment, my assistants know exactly what's going on, and so they will prepare the patient. Um, they'll have them in and usually take off their arch wires or their aligners, and um, they'll have them rinse. So this is an important step, and we have them rinse for the, uh, with chlorohexidine rinse two times for one minute each. That's a long time, actually, when you're rinsing. So uh, do make sure that that's well taken care of. Um, some people say, well, let's, let's get the anesthetic in there, but it's, it's also hard to rinse once your mouth is, is already half frozen. So we actually do the chlorhexidine rinse first. Uh, and then uh, I will come by and I will we'll have our um, panoramic x-ray up uh, on the computer screen and uh, I will be having a good look around and palpating and deciding precisely where I want my microosteoperforations to go. And, uh, and then in the meantime, um, we will apply the, uh, the anesthetic. Now, of course, there are two um, anesthetic uh, possibilities for you. Um, those of you that have heard me before know that I prefer a little local infiltration um, with a needle. Uh, but there is a uh, wonderful formulation out there of uh, of a topical anesthetic, it can be used as well. And uh, ask your uh, your Propel rep for information on that. Um, but my assistants will have already applied um, regular topical, and then I'll come in and, and uh, give the patient a drop of freezing. And then we'll do the orthodontic, um, the actual adjustment while we're waiting for the anesthetic to take effect. Uh, either, you know, try in the new aligners, or we'll uh, change the arch wires or whatever we plan to do for that patient that particular day. And, uh, and then I'll usually uh, run away while my, pa while my assistant uh, finishes up um, what I've told her to do for that particular patient. And we'll give the patient a bit of time to, uh, to numb up. And so therefore, the microosteal perforation will be the last thing I do before we say goodbye to that patient that day. Um, so. I'll come back, the patient will be numb, the uh, orthodontic adjustment will be already done, and uh, I'll go ahead and perform the microosteoperforations. I think in general, uh, since we first started with this, we're doing less uh, per site, and that has come from the recognition that uh, there's a pretty good halo of influence with this, uh, with this particular procedure. And um, you really don't have to do uh, that many. We were, at first, we were doing like sort of three in a row amongst incisors and that sort of thing. And we're finding now that two and sometimes even one, especially amongst lower incisors, is really all you need because we're seeing the effect um, quite a ways out from the, uh, from the actual uh, puncture point. And um, we but therefore not, it isn't quite as necessary to do as many as we originally thought we would have to. Uh, we don't have to go as deep as we originally thought we had to as well. A good three millimeters in the anterior and five to seven uh, in the posterior, depending on the thickness of soft tissue and thickness of bone, is, is going to do just fine for you. So uh, we sort of learn that it's not quite as necessary to go as deep or as, as do as many and also to, to not do it quite as frequently as well because the studies have also come back suggesting that uh, the effect is good for up to 12 weeks after the uh, microosteal perforation. It sort of peaks at about 24 hours after the procedure is done and then uh, up to 12 weeks we're still getting a nice effect. And uh, I, you know, I got to tell you, I, I've been <laughs> a new product guy before and an early adopter and, and all that sort of things. And, and uh, um, sometimes, you know, I like to say that I'm on the leading edge and sometimes it's the bleeding edge. But uh, with this particular device, I've really, really been pleased uh, at how predictable it is and uh, how well accepted it is by the patient and uh, how how much it's really helped my practice.
um, and I, I always like to be known as the guy who's going to is going to uh, have the latest technology and uh, and also the guy who is constantly learning. So the power driver is now available in the United States and uh, it, it is indeed made specifically for this purpose. It has um, an RPM uh, adjustment switch on a, on a digital readout and it has forward and reverse. Um, when you first get this you, the little latch, you may actually want to just bend the, uh, the latch in a little bit towards the contra angle so that it snaps a little more tightly and therefore there's no chance for that bird to be lost. Um, so the only thing therefore that has to be um, never reused is the actual burr with this setup so, that, so it's even more sort of uh, environmentally correct and, uh, uh, and good for us. The other neat things about the power driver are that uh, we don't have to apply quite as much pressure with the hand device, even if the patient's well anesthetized, they actually feel a fair, good, a fair bit of pressure and they can tell that we're really, really pushing on them. This device, since it's rotary, um, kind of is like a, almost like a self-tapping uh, device that, that makes its own way into the bone without quite as much pressure. Of course, we still push on it a little bit, but not as much as the handheld devices. And uh, the forward and the reverse, seems to work pretty pretty slick and uh, it's quicker and also more accessible to the posterior areas. Of course the handheld devices are all straight and trying to get way back in around a first or second molar is, is tricky with the handheld device uh, whereas the contra angle of course will just slide back there and do a nice job. So we're excited to have this available to us and uh, the Canadians in the audience, hang in, <laughs> it's, it's coming to Canada. So here is uh, my friend Thomas Shipley uh, from Arizona actually showing us uh, how he does this in his office. You can see he's using the Oregate type retraction system and uh, his assistant is very uh, actively and attentively standing by to help him out with this device. So let's see if we can get this uh, uh, this video to roll. I apologize if it's a little bit fragmented, but I'll describe what he's up to as we go along here as well. So you can see Dr. Shipley is focusing on where he is doing the actual microosteo perforations and asking his assistant to be the one who uh, is, is the one who makes the device go uh, forward and backwards, so it's sort of clockwise and counterclockwise. And she's hitting the buttons at the correct moment to, uh, to, to allow it to go in and to back out. And therefore, Dr. Shipley can be very focused on, uh, ex on doing exactly uh, what he needs to do, and that is to get the, uh, the microosteal perforations in the right places. It's a very slick system. This device is governed at 45 RPM, which is which has been looked at carefully to not be too fast. Um, of course, we're all about causing uh, inflammation and, and a cytokine response, uh, but we're not into um, bone necrosis or, or too much heat or too much speed. So you can see him going right in between the central incisors. There are times when uh, we'd rather not do that, and I speak specifically of someone with a, a large upper labial frenal, frenal pole, and um, we prefer actually maybe not to go right in around the frenum, and we actually know that with that halo that I talked about, you don't necessarily have to be right in between the two central incisors if you're on the distal. Uh, area of the of the roots of the central incisors, um, 
you'll you'll know that the uh, the halo of influence is beyond um, and into the kind of mesial of those roots as well. So thanks again to uh, Thomas Shipley for being so generous uh, with his knowledge and uh, with sharing that video. Okay, so um, I just want to review, review with you a few more things about treatment. Uh, most patients require one to two treatments. Uh, the, the two treatments I've found um, generally are the really long ones, like we're closing a very big space with braces. Uh, or we're bringing in impacted canines with, with braces, or we're doing a lot of uh, clear aligners, and so, you know, you get through uh, about 12 or, or 14 of them uh, if you're on the one-week uh, Invisalign aligner uh, regimen, and you're, you're wanting the effect again, uh, you'll have to reapply it at that. So most are one to two. There have been a couple where we've actually had to do three treatments. Um, those ones are the really, really tough things like uh, impacted canines. Uh, we're starting to study really closely the effect, uh, how, how this works on adult uh, expansion cases. And um, it's kind of my duty to let you know that at this very, very moment, that's a bit of an off-label uh, approach uh, because we haven't got all of the science in just, just yet on that particular application, but it really makes intuitive sense that uh, it's going to be neat for, uh, for um, expansion cases in adults. And uh, I think that um, that's going to be, uh, you know, of course, the transverse in an adult is one of our most challenging uh, directions that we want to go. And so if, there's, if, this, if this is going to actually help us out, and I honestly believe it, it, it is, uh, that's going to be a, a really neat application of the system. Um, so mesial and distal to the teeth that you want to move, we generally do two to three or sometimes just one, especially amongst lower incisors. And, uh, and sometimes it's only in one direction. And we, we uh, talked before about how um, the ability to direct the effect in certain directions uh, according to your anchorage needs is actually a really neat advantage of microosteoperforation over other systems such as um, patient-delivered systems uh, like, like vibration technology, as in we can really sort of pinpoint, if you'll excuse the, the pun, uh, where we would like the effect to occur and actually avoid where we would like the effect to not occur and uh, therefore guide our anchorage as well. And of course, a classic example of that would be if we want to close, a, say, a lower space with minimum anchorage, um, then I may be uh, tending to do more microosteoperforation mesial to uh, to where we want that molar toward where we want that molar to go, and less uh, uh, on the other side. Um, the osteoclastic response, as mentioned, is about six to ten millimeters around that where you have perforated. So uh, there's lots of room for that. Uh, when we're talking to patients, we don't usually say, well, sometimes I do, if, the patient, if I know the patient can take it, I'll say, look, we're going to put some holes in your head and uh, it's going to really help move these teeth. Uh, but generally, we will use languaging like uh, we'll put a few little dimples um, around the teeth, soften up the bone a little bit, and therefore those teeth are going to move uh, quite a bit faster, and, or your aligners are going to track a lot better or uh, this space is going to close uh, much more readily, um, or th these lower incisors are going to untangle uh, better because we do that. Uh, someone suggested acupuncture for, for the teeth, but I know the acupuncturists get a little bit concerned that we would use that word, but, it's, but the idea is come up with words that aren't necessarily, uh, um, you know, like we're going to drill holes in, into your jaw bones because that really isn't so, and, um, and it may not be the, the greatest uh, messaging. So we come up with our euphemisms, and they work well, and the patient almost always is pleasantly surprised by how little trauma they actually feel and how good they feel the next day. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk a bit more today about uh, proactive and reactive use of the system, um, but generally, uh, reactively, I am running into a lot of situations where I'm just, I, you know, something has slowed me down or I'm, I'm stuck 
or one particular area just isn't working well. And uh, sure enough, we apply the microosteal perforation system to that particular area, and all of a sudden we're back in the game. And that, that is, uh, that's powerful, for sure. Um, we talked a bit about the depth selection, generally about three millimeters towards the front of the mouth, posterior five and to seven, and about, and about seven millimeters in the, uh, in the palate. And uh, you'll see that on the, uh, the little sleeve around the, um, the, cl the closed end hand device has uh, graduations on, him, on it at three, five, and seven millimeters. But after a while, you'll get confident, and especially if you're using the uh, contra-angle handpiece, of uh, making your own judgments as to how, how far you're going in. Um, the osteoclastic effect peaks. In the first, after the first day and remains elevated for 12 weeks. And we've watched that by measuring uh, cytokine activity. And so therefore, about every 10 to 12 weeks, uh, you can actually repeat the treatment. At first, we're doing a, just about every visit, but uh, figured out quickly that that really wasn't necessary. So here we are. Um, they can be performed either buccally or lingually. Hardly ever do I perform them lingually, uh, except with uh, impacted canines. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, that's, that's one of the slowest things that we do in our office. So uh, I'm very happy after the initial exposure, about 12 weeks out, to uh, pull out my uh, microosteal perforation device and, um, and get going to, uh, to hurry these canines along. Patients get antsy too, like they've got gaps in their smile, they've got these big springs in there, and they've got these uh, canines half in. They, they'd really like to, um, to have you speed that up. So that's a neat application of the system for sure. Uh, where are we perforating? Uh, as mentioned in the anterior three, five in about the middle teeth, and seven in the molars. And uh, usually in the lower anteriors, I'm, I'm, these days I'm only doing one around each uh, of these lower incisors. Uh, I try and get down uh, a little bit close to the center of uh, rotation of the tooth, and uh, I like to feel that that's the place where I'd like the most influence to occur. And uh, I think that's a rather neat part of this system as well, is it can be really targeted. You know, in the olden days when we did these corticotomies, they were pretty, like, uh, untargeted and just did everything. Um, whereas with the microosteoperforations, we can put things uh, nicely in a sweet spot that we know is going to really help us out for things like bodily movement. So uh, there we are. We're, we're putting these at least a couple of millimeters apart when we're doing multiple ones. Don't necessarily have to be in a straight line. They can be in an L-shaped or triangular pattern as well. Uh, and that's fine. And of course, it can be uh, used with whatever you're using uh, to move teeth, be it uh, braces or clear aligners. The cytokines just don't care what you're doing, what you're using to uh, apply the force. Uh, they just know how to, uh, to recruit extracellular activity. So the differentiation between proactive and reactive, generally proactive, we thought of it in advance and we've, we've kind of let the patient know that, that it's available and um, we'll, we'll go ahead and do it right off the bat, especially with, uh, with clear aligners. And reactive is generally used with clear aligners when, um, when something just isn't tracking. Of course, we're all familiar with, uh, with upper lateral incisors that just just seem to uh, not track well, or things like uh, erupting canines. Uh, no matter how many fancy attachments and how much IPR we do, we still struggle with those a fair bit. So uh, kind of neat to apply microosteal perforation to those cases to make it more predictable. So we're finding not only does the tooth movement happen faster, but it happens more predictably as well. And we're seeing fewer Case, needs for case refinements or mid-course corrections uh, because of untracking aligners. Once again, with, with aligners, you know, if the patient's not cooperating, that, then there's not much else you can do. But uh, we really do feel that this is helping not just to speed up Invisalign treatments, but, um, but also to uh, make them more, more efficient and on the money. So that's uh, what the little uh, osteoperforations look like. And, uh, 
it, after even like a day or so, there's not much evidence left that of uh, of the little perforations that you've made, and we've had good reports from our patients about them afterwards. Of course, we're careful not to have them use any sort of uh, anti-inflammatory um, as a as pain relief when we're done. Um, the big the name of this game is to cause some some localized inflammation and uh, to not have anything get in the way of it. So uh, we uh, we recommend against non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and instead we generally only use uh, acetaminophen and usually an extra strength Tylenol is all that has been necessary that I've seen. And once again, the application of this system is, is, uh, is truly uh, limited only by your imagination. Uh, we're using it for uh, crowding, space closing, uh, deep bites, open bites, midline discrepancies, uh, class 2, class 3 intrusions. Uh, you name the orthodontic movement and chances are it's going to be, be able to be enhanced and uh, sped up through the use of micro perforation. Exciting stuff. So I want to show you cases. Um, most of these cases are, are mine, and you'll see them mostly in braces and mostly reactive. So I tried to um, select cases for you today where uh, I have been not necessarily thinking about using microosteoperforation right off the bat, but sharing with you how it can get you out of a bind and uh, help you along with finishing the case. And and I'll tell you, it has really made things better in my office. Uh, much less sort of despair when when a tooth won't seem to be moving or or we can't seem to unravel uh, really crowded teeth. Uh, first thing that comes to my mind now is micro osteoperforation. Let the patient know next time. Hey, we're going to put a little dimple, a few dimples around your teeth. I'm going to get this. Uh, we'll get this party started. And uh, patients have been really, really responsive to it. Um, this fellow came in and uh, he, those teeth had been sort of that way for a long time, deep bite, um, worn incisors, and just, uh, you know, those teeth were, were like glass in concrete. And so uh, um, I went ahead and um, applied the micro perforation. You can see at that time I was using uh, a couple in, uh, in columns in the interradicular space amongst the lower incisors. And in two months, uh, I was very pleased to see this happening. Um, I, had, I did my own little split mouse study here because I did not micro osteoperforate the premolars and molar that I was trying to move. And so it's quite profound to me how the lower incisors reacted, uh, but I was still uh, being at my usual rate with the premolars and the molars. So that was pretty, ex uh, that was, this case was one that really convinced me of the um, efficacy of this system. So from there to there in two months, that's, that's uh, pretty compelling. And of course now, uh, I would go all the way around and do um, the molars and the premolars as well and get everything happening all at once. Um, didn't know that at that point, so now I do. Uh, this one, I was trying to close a um, lower incisor extraction space, and man, I was using all my tricks, the uh, power chain and the uh, weave underneath the wire, and just could not seem to get, I could get tipping, of course, but I just could not seem to get bodily movement. And uh, once again, I think it's a really under-recognized uh, advantage of micro osteoperforation, and that is you can get right down where it counts to have this effect occur to the roots of these teeth, uh, and all of a sudden, before you know it, we've got bodily movement in uh, in three months, um, and our spaces are closed up. And we've been showing through the uh, CBCT studies that that effect is occurring in three dimensions, and it actually is providing us with some true bodily movement. So once again, the, the ability to deliver the effect where it really counts, which is two-thirds of the way down the route, of course, uh, is uh, an exciting aspect of micro osteoperforation. So from there to there, in, in three months, I would take uh, any, any three months of the year for sure.
this patient had uh, lingual braces on the top. That's why you can't see them. But uh, we uh, we do a lot of that, where we do lingual on the upper and uh, labial on the lower. Here's Matthew, uh, neat guy. We're uh, we're working to uh, bring down a canine on him. He's he's you can see he's uh, a young adult, and uh, you know once again got everything going. We use a lot of braided wires so that we hold the arch form, but will allow for vertical settling with elastics and uh, and also they'll take a few little bends if we need them and torques as well. So, you know, this guy's still a little bit class 2 uh, and uh, we're trying to get this canine to come down and get the, the class 2 corrected. So um, I went ahead and did the micro perforation around this, around this canine too and in four weeks it was there and uh, so I was, I think the, um, the arch wire along with the, um, the micro perforation and our little uh, power chain really helped uh, bring that to town. So that's pretty exciting actually if we can get that to happen in four weeks from there uh, to there. Pretty cool. And you can see a really nice response from the gingiva. This was the day of course that I did the micro perforation. So things look a little rough and ragged but uh, four weeks later I can't even tell that um, you know, I've, I've been in there or that there's been any actual uh, perforation. The cytokines know that we've been in there and we know that they'll still know uh, for 12 weeks in total. But four weeks later, we don't see much external evidence uh, that, that of what has occurred. So from there to there, in four weeks, absolutely, we'll take it. You'll also see there was some closure of the open bite here. Um, we find that these canines that are just miserable and stuck uh, will act like their own little TADs and actually um, start intruding some of the other neighboring teeth. So it's exciting that when we can get them going and actually reverse that effect as well. So uh, kind of a neat application, more reactive of course. I didn't really think that we would need this uh, when we went into the case with Matthew, but um, uh, it was sure nice to have it in my quiver of arrows uh, when the time came. <clears throat> and in the vast majority of these cases, um, we actually don't charge for this because I am aware of the economics of, of taking, well, first of all, getting out of a frustrating situation and uh, taking a number of months off of Matthew's treatment time. Uh, it's going to make this case overall more, more profitable and probably save my reputation as well, which is, which is not something that I take lightly as well. So kind of need to have it for that reason. In a lot of cases, we're proactive about it and we'll usually charge um, a few extra hundred dollars to cover our costs on the system. But um, in a lot of these reactive cases, we're not. Um, although in many of your jurisdictions, you'll find there is a, a fee in the guide for this that you can charge and uh, ask you to check with your Propel rep on that particular topic. Uh, Adam, here he is, a uh, stubborn lower incisor guy. Um, we, once again, a young uh, adult. He had a long time ago traumatically evulsed uh, an upper central incisor, so we're going to open up some space for him and uh, prepare him for an implant replacement of that tooth. And of course, at the same time, we want to uh, align his lower anteriors. Once again, wasn't anticipating a whole lot of need in advance for uh, micro perforation at the time. I was just getting into it. Uh, but um, it, we were sure glad along the way that, uh, that we had it available to us. Sometimes these adults with uh, crowded lower incisors, they've been that way for a long time. These can be miserable. To, uh, to get going and so uh, we sort of got to this point and this particular tooth just wasn't responding to us. We use a lot of thermally activated copper nitai wires and uh, just couldn't seem to get it uh, rocking for us here. You can see though we're having some success with opening up the space um, and I'll ask you to note the exaggerated bracket positions as well for diverging the roots of the neighboring teeth away from the implant site. So uh, we do a lot of that. So at 11 months, I'm kind of going, oh gosh, you know, I can't, I can't get these lower incisors to behave. Uh, hey, Adam, what do you say we uh, we do a little bit of micro perforation? You can see, we'll, the particular tooth that we want to move will steel tie it. We'll also chain away 
from that tooth and not unheard of to do some interproximal reduction around those teeth as well. Uh, so those sort of three things, the, uh, the chain away, the steel tie, the interproximal reduction combined with micro osteoperforation is often the answer to get you out of these uh, stubborn uh, incisor um, issues. And sure enough, here we are, four weeks later, and uh, that tooth has smartly fell into line, and uh, Adam was pretty impressed. Um, and we're getting uh, we're getting bit close to uh, to finishing him up. Those are the box elastics that we use, uh, the four ounce mediums that we use in a in a parallelogram uh, type arrangement to get us some a little bit of class two, but also some uh, vertical settling as well. So we got from there uh, to there in four weeks with Adam and uh, excited about that. And once again, gingival response looks really good. Uh, four weeks later, he's back to being pink and healthy and uh, um, I think that that's neat. So, you know, of course, we first must do no harm. And it's, it's exciting that uh, microosteoperfusion keeps that promise for us. Uh, Rachel, uh, deciduous lower incisor extraction. She had an extra little lower incisor. And uh, I'll tell you, you know, like young people like this, <laughs> they don't like to have lower front spaces for very long. So uh, Rachel knew that she was uh, congenitally missing one uh, um, permanent lower incisor and that this deciduous lower incisor, uh, it was time to go. So it was a call to action for orthodontics for her and um, she just said, come on doc, let's, let's get this done as fast as is humanly possible. So there's a little deciduous tooth. We usually put braces on first uh, just to, uh, to speed things along. The actual extraction itself has its own uh, cytokine response as well, of course. So uh, we'll actually wait a little bit on these ones and not do the microosteoperforations right away, um, <clears throat> knowing that the extraction itself has caused a little bit of the uh, a similar type response. So here we go. Uh, the tooth is out, and we've already started to close the space a little bit. And um, once again, she has lingual braces on the top, and we're using. Um, a lot of these sort of white wires, I know uh, we're, we're probably inviting a bit of extra friction into the system with those white wires, <coughs> but um, patients really like them, especially patients who would like aesthetic treatment. And away we go. So I'm going to uh, microosteoperforate into the edentulous space and also on the distal of both of the incisors that I want to eventually come in together. So here we are at six weeks. I'm using those uh, weaves underneath the wire, and, um, and I'm also using power chain to uh, to hurry things along for us. You can see a nice nice bit of uh, gingival response. Here we are at 10 weeks, so we're coming together. Usually with these, of course, we try and center the one uh, lower incisor, the middle lower incisor, right in the on the upper center line. And we studied this carefully, and we realized that if the spaces are closed and that tooth is nicely centered, uh, people have real difficulty figuring out that there's a missing lower incisor. So from there to there in 10 weeks, that's uh, pretty pretty compelling for me. And I uh, just saw Rachel the other day, and actually the space is all, is all closed at about 14 weeks. So uh, interesting, too. It's, it's changed our appointment intervals a little bit. We used to have everyone out at 6, 8, and, uh, week intervals, but now I'm finding my patients, I'm wanting to see them more often because I'm running up through the wires and through their aligners a lot faster. And uh, so we're actually seeing our patients a little more often, but of course for shorter uh, overall treatment times, so pretty exciting. Uh, here's Siong, she had an impacted cuspid. Most of the impacted canines that we see are stuck in the palate. Uh, hers was actually uh, buckley. Um, positioned, and as you can see she's got a deciduous upper left uh, canine. She's got a deep bite, and uh, and there we are. Sure enough, uh, a stuck uh, upper can canine tooth. We can usually tell um, between the pano and the ceph uh, where those teeth are sort of buccolingually as well. 
So there we are, we're in braces. Usually we try and get up to a rectangular wire and open up a bit more space than the deciduous tooth took up, of course, because the new tooth is going to be wider. Uh, we have our surgeon uncover these, and uh, the surgeon himself actually bonds uh, while the, the system is open. Uh, our little eruption chains to the uh, labial surface of the tooth, or sometimes the palatal surface, or sometimes whatever he can catch. And then uh, we'll see the patient shortly afterwards, and he will have uh, sewn the flap back, and all that will be hanging out is this little eruption chain and uh, we run it down to a spring-loaded mechanism on the, uh, on the arch wire. And the, the progression is each time the patient comes in, we lose one or sometimes two links, and then, um, and then the, the tooth progressively comes in. And you can direct this either mesially or distally, depending on where that tooth started out. Um, so, you know, I, wanna, I want it to come down a little bit distally, so I'm going to use the uh, lateral incisor as the anchor for the spring, and then uh, uh, compress the spring towards the lateral incisor, and then down comes the impacted tooth. So there we are. Uh, we uh, performed the microosteoperforation on this day, and you can see it around all the way around here, up in the uh, alveolar mucosa. Uh, here we are at four weeks, and uh, it's, it's actually coming down. The patient's pretty excited. We, she can actually see it. And so in four weeks, we got to that. Today, I saw her today, actually, again, at eight weeks. And the tooth is about here right now. So shortly after that, we, we take the chain off and put an actual button or a bracket on the tooth and uh, run our wire uh, right up into the, into the bracket or the button. Um, the other neat thing is because this tooth is moving so well and efficiently, I'm not seeing that secondary effect that we described where the other teeth get uh, intruded uh, when we use them as anchors for being down and back to canine. So I'm finding I don't have to recover quite as much from those secondary effects later on by using microosteoperforation to speed along the eruption of impacted teeth. Here's Edme. She's a, a neat lady. She's in her 60s, and she has said to me, uh, "This uh, she had a little uh, bridge up here and and uh, and a tooth that was failing." And she said, "Okay, doc, all of this has to go. But by the way, I only want one space, and I only and I want it between the molar and the second premolar. So I need you to move absolutely everything." Uh, mesially. And uh, of course, about four or five years ago, I would have said, gee, you know, that's that's pretty well impossible. But nowadays, with our uh, TAD technology, um, we're actually able to do it. So that's that's exciting. So we're going to make this, both, she's generally missing lateral incisors as well. So we turn both these canines into laterals. We're going to uh, remove this tooth, which has failed, and it had a little cantilever bridge. And we're going to move uh, this guy forward to meet the canine and then there'll be only one space left, and that'll be between the molar and the uh, second premolar. So away we go. And uh, here's the setup. We use the TAD here uh, between the canine and the central incisor. The tooth is out, and uh, we've got a little uh, false tooth on the wire with a bracket on it. And we are now starting to drag this tooth mesially with power chain, with a coil spring, with uh, a TAD, and we're augmenting the whole system with microosteoperforation. Four weeks, here we are. Things are starting to close up. You can see um, that th we're, we're shaving this uh, little pontic down as we go along. There's starting to be some space open up over here, and uh, we're going to keep things rocking for Edme. So now, 12 weeks, you can see my pontic is, is just about gone here. This tooth is moving along. This is what, uh, we're going to redo the microosteoperforation for her. This is one case where I might consider using it on the lingual as well or on the palatal because I think it would be neat, although the effect probably would come through uh, from the buckle, but it might be kind of neat to, uh, to speed things along on the lingual as well because we know that this premolar is a, has, a, has a good size root on it and uh, might be neat to hit things over here as well to uh, get a little bit more movement without rotation. 
so we went ahead and did the second uh, micro osteoperforation, and uh, we're still using the TAD and our power chain and our uh, open coil spring. And here we are now, uh, 24 weeks, and uh, we're, we've eliminated the pontic now, and we've opened up the space. Uh, we're going to close up that last bit of space and get the uh, the second premolar touching that that canine. So a lot of movement and a lot of work, but uh, really helped along with a couple of uh, microosteal perforations. Okay, here's another lady, Elaine. She has a, a edential space on the lower, and uh, we get this a lot where patients just go, Doc, is there any way you can possibly close this space? You know, I've been uh, quoted five grand uh, for, a, for an implant replacement, and they say they want to do some bone grafting and all that sort of thing, too. So first of all, of course, we check and make sure there's enough bone, uh, but, uh, uh, and often we'll invoke the help of a periodontist as well in these cases. This is the TAD system that I use, uh, and you can see there's a little uh, target that uh, we put it where we think uh, we should put the TAD, and then we take a, a radiograph. And of course, here, it's probably not a good spot, so I know I'm going to put it uh, right sort of on the mesial aspect of this loop. So I, I, really, I like this system for uh, knowing where to to place my TADs accurately and safely as well. So we get the TAD down there. This is what we'll usually use off the TADs. It's it's a ligature wire, and uh, we've got it, a little elastomeric that we're running uh, back to the molar tube with. We're also running off the wire with some sliding mechanics as well. And for that, we use a 9 millimeter um, titanium closing spring. This lady had quite a deep bite and was pretty rough on her front teeth, so the dentist actually asked us to open her up and also uh, perhaps even create a little bit of extra overjet. So we don't mind uh, losing a bit of anchorage here uh, as we close the space. So at four months, here we are. Uh, space is just about closed on the lower, and um, we, we continue to motor along. Six months, we're done. You can see I've removed the TAD. Uh, and uh, the this, this space is, is closed and we're ready to finish her up. She too has lingual braces on the top. So six months and one uh, mop. I'm, I'm sorry the angle isn't all that great, but there was a good, you saw from the panoramic film, that there was a good seven to eight millimeter space down there that we closed in uh, six months, and that, that was uh, compelling to me. One thing I'm finding a little bit with the TADs is that the uh, microosteal perforation actually loosens them, uh, sometimes probably by the same, uh, for the same reason as it moves teeth so well. Uh, so we're actually choosing slightly bigger um, TADs and be a little more careful to make sure they're uh, uh, well engaged before we uh, load them. Okay, here's Raj, uh, neat guy. He's got a lower canine uh, that uh, a baby tooth was had stuck around forever and ever, and he actually had uh, a bridge down uh, on the lower right hand side, and uh, he was tired of it. And you can see a little Maryland bridge here, and we are aware that there's a canine down there somewhere, and so uh, Raj decided that he wanted his own permanent tooth to come up. And you can see it looks like a big orca. You, you just got to know that's going to be a tough one to bring up. So we go ahead and we prepare the case uh, for Raj, and we start um, opening up the space. And we've got the tooth uh, uncovered and up. But of course, it came in quite rotated. So uh, we went in and uh, per, um, applied the micro osteoperforation along with our super elastic uh, nickel titanium wires and uh, a little help from some power chain, and at eight weeks, uh, we're getting this kind of movement. That's a, you've got to know that's a big tooth with a long root. And so uh, in that eight-week period, uh, we got a fair bit of rotation and, uh, and, and a bit of uh, mesialization as well. So we're excited, and Raj is following things along, and he's pretty, he's pretty happy. And I just know that before, that would have taken me quite a bit longer without my perforation. Spend the last few minutes talking to you how we're uh, positioning ourselves in the marketplace, and then of course I'll stick around as long as anyone needs uh, to answer your questions as well. Um, 
with marketing, we you can really actually be uh, uh, use it as one of your differentiators. So I encourage you to put it on your website and in your social media, and you can link to uh, Propel's own sites uh, to help you. We also have a lot of printed material for your office, and uh, there's some neat stuff on YouTube as well. So um, go ahead and have a look, see what's out there, and attach it to your own um, marketing things, uh, whatever you like out there. Um, it's quite compelling if you can uh, say, we usually don't say braces or aligners in, in about half the time. I try not to be that specific because uh, everyone's a little different. But uh, generally, I'll say things like, you know, we can really uh, speed things up. Um, this neat one is uh, is brides. We've been going to these wedding shows, and uh, sure enough, the bride comes in in January, and she goes, well, you know, my wedding's in June, and I need straight teeth, by the way, Doc. Oh, and I need some time to do some whitening as well, so uh, let's go. So they're great candidates for microosteoperforation. Um, we really emphasize that uh, this is, it, it's very effective and it is uh, well studied and the science is really great behind it. And it's not that new, it's just been nicely packaged these days and absolutely minimally invasive, not compliance driven, which I think is a real advantage over some of the technologies. I find even our best patients after, you know, a, a three or four months of using the vibration technology, it really had enough of it, and honestly, to find 20 minutes in some people's day, uh, it, it's it's tough. So uh, we say, you know, just pop, pop it in for 20 minutes when you're relaxing, and and they go, Doc, <laughs> sorry, I don't I don't relax. Um, and no downtime. We found very few sort of post uh, procedure troubles, and uh, patients, you know, when they when the anesthetic comes out. They don't report a whole lot of, of uh, problems. Uh, Propel will help you out as soon as you order from them. You'll show up on their doctor locator. This is the one for uh, North Carolina. And uh, they'll uh, pe allow people to put in their um, zip code. And they'll see who are the providers in their area. And uh, hopefully they'll link to your website. And, uh, and away we go. Uh, it's, as mentioned, really gaining ground and it's exciting. Each new meeting that I go to, I learn about another application of the micro perforation system and uh, just, it's just so much fun in our profession because uh, people really do take new technologies and, uh, and uh, take them out for a spin. So the take-homes from tonight, there are absolutely um, uh, many applications of the micro perforation system. Works really nicely with uh, uh, temporary anchorage device cases, but I encourage you to be thoughtful about the TADs and maybe consider a slightly larger one than you would normally use, just because the same effect that, that moves teeth can often loosen your TADs as well. Um, the, I really like this idea of, of being directed and very targeted not just on a per tooth basis, but also for, uh, to set up your anchorage. And I think that's an advantage over micro osteoperforation that micro osteoperforation has over some of the other systems, which are way more general. Uh, 12 weeks, absolutely, we'll, uh, we'll repeat them. We keep track of, of how many weeks have passed. And uh, some patients, uh, act, to be honest, will say, no, look, I'm, um, I'm good. The, the one thing, the one episode was, uh, was great, um, but, uh, I don't, uh, I'd rather not do another one, and that's fine. Um, we'll give them that option for sure. The, uh, we don't reuse the same device for, even for a, a, any particular patient. The, uh, uh, the actual blade part uh, is a single-use device, and it's to be uh, um, disposed of as a biohazard uh, in the Sharps container. Proven, absolutely. The science is really good behind this. Safe, yes. Uh, and now delivered through our rotary accelerator, which is really exciting stuff. And of course, not too tough to add it to your daily practice. Um, they're uh, also compared to other systems, not very not very expensive, and um, easy to add. Even um, if you want to just have it in your back pocket for things that that pop up that you're struggling with, or do it on a proactive way with with many of your cases and get down to one week or sometimes even three day. 
aligner tray changes, uh, your prerogative, absolutely, but uh, kind of neat to add to your practice and make you uh, well known as the accelerator. So get out there, gang, and uh, speed up your orthodontic cases and have lots of fun with microosteoperforation. First question, uh, one moment please here, is from Cindy. And Cindy, thank you for your question. It is, do you use this in conjunction with Invisalign? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Um, both proactively and reactively. So um, certain of our colleagues have really gotten into this on pretty well. Every case where they say to the patient, look, we're going to get down to one week and sometimes three day um, aligner changes and uh, we're going to do so by using microosteoperforation. So they do it sort of generally amongst uh, most of the teeth, keeping in mind that uh, 10 millimeter sphere of, uh, of effect. Um, or sometimes we'll use it reactively with Invisalign. And if you do a lot of Invisalign, you know how miserable sometimes upper lateral incisors are and uh, sometimes lower incisors. And so uh, we keep it in our back pocket to help s uh, speed up Invisalign cases and also to make the aligners track better as well. So it's not just acceleration, it's uh, better tracking as well. Is root resorption ever a concern? And the, the answer is, is, the answer is good on this one. Uh, George, thank you for your question. Um, we've, we've looked at this carefully and we're, and we're aware that we haven't changed anything else besides the, the denseness, density of the bone and the cellular activity. So it's not like we're using heavier forces or, or some new uh, technique to, uh, that could possibly invoke uh, root resorption. Um, and so we're, we're seeing a higher rate of tooth movement without, uh, without burning roots. And the other key point is we're actually spending less time in orthodontics. And a lot of the most recent studies have come to realize that it wasn't necessarily always just heavy forces or, or something else that was causing root resorption. It was just spending too darn long in braces or aligners. And that's why we were seeing uh, resorption. So the fact that we're uh, not changing the way we're moving teeth and we're finishing cases faster means uh, much less chance of root resorption. Okay, is relapse um, tooth memory less prevalent? Another, another great question, thank you. Um, and the answer is, you know, we're, uh, we want to be a little bit cagey about that because we're moving teeth through less um, dense bone, <clears throat> and um, I think that we're wanting to be careful because, uh, especially near the end, we'd rather not have the bone be all of that that um, sort of the less dense. So we're we're choosing to use Propel earlier on in the treatment as well. And the other answer to your question is if we uh, are. Um, moving teeth a lot faster, then, then I, I honestly think that we would, uh, we, we would want to be a little bit more careful about our, our retainer procedure. So, um, especially with so lower incisors that have moved uh, quickly, uh, we'll often consider a fixed retainer and often overlay uh, a um, clear retainer as well. But I think in general, we're, we're going to be a little bit more careful about retention on these cases because things have happened quickly and we have decreased the density of the bone temporarily. But uh, um, I think that uh, it's a worthwhile question and we would be uh, remiss if we didn't consider uh, more thoughtful retention. Uh, Ken, thank you for your question. Um, does it improve intrusion of incisors? and res reduce root resorption uh, during intrusion. And Ken, you're correct in, in asking that question because uh, intrusion uh, is, is a uh, movement that actually we want to be careful about and, uh, and it is a little bit more prone to, um, to, to damage to the roots if we overpower the system. So intrusion itself takes a lot of patience and, uh, um, and not too high force levels. And we really are, are enjoying the G5 uh, Invisalign um, modification where we're using those uh, bite ramps for an anterior, uh, lower anterior intrusion in deep bites. And um, so the answer is no, we're not seeing any more uh, root resorption, but it does help us with intrusion of incisors. And I think for 
incisor teeth that actually want to intrude, um, I would try and get a little bit more apically on them with my microosteal perforations in order to make sure that my halo of influence is well down around the apex of the tooth to get more efficient um, intrusion. All right, so I hope that uh, today or this evening has been inspiring for you all, and um, I'm very grateful for your attention and encourage you to uh, try the system and have fun with it and uh, report back to us all, please, with your successes and or concerns. Um, and wish you all a most pleasant evening.